Filipinos are, um, and I'm, I'm painting broad strokes, but we are inherently a caring, loving people. Why not extend that love right here and right now when a community who is asking for it? Welcome to This Filipino American Life, a podcast that explores the nuanced experiences of Filipinos in the United States at Ipapa. <laughs> my name is Joe Bernardo, and I'm joined by my fellow hosts, Ryan Carpio, Elaine Delalis, and Mike, producer Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi, everybody. Okay. This episode is brought to you by T Pal Sarah Miller. Sarah Miller? Not falling for it. <laughs> Not falling Hi, Sarah. For it. Thank you, Sarah, for your support and for being the T Pal of this episode. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and we also want to give a few shout outs. Um, a couple episodes ago, we did an episode about um, uh, Filipino graduations. Ah, and yes, we did. We did receive a few uh, messages um, yes. for people asking us to shout them out. Yeah. Yeah. So nice. Yeah, we have two. Uh, one is from Adora Yabut, who wants to shout out her brother, Mark Allen Yabut, for getting a second master's from UPenn. Wow, second uh, master's. Can second. you, uh, you want to give me one of those? Uh? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, right? You've got a master's from the streets. From the streets. From the streets. Man, he deserves and like two Dr. R design stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Throwback. <laughs> Throwback. <laughs> extended. <laughs> extended bar. He, need, he needs an extended bar for the extended master's yeah. program. My second master's. <laughs> <laughs> second master's. And the second person is um, Chris Famularkano. Kano. I asked for a phonetic spelling, <laughs> so that's why I read it that way. Oh, wants okay. to shout out, <laughs> wants to shout out their partner Cheryl Ina Buhain Famularkano for receiving their masters in higher education. Yeah, so yeah. Congratulations. Yay. Those are awesome. Glad that there are two more masters in this world of their own particular fields. Filipino right academic excellence. That's Yay. awesome. Yes. And if so my mom hears this, it's like, oh, be like them. I was like, oh, <laughs> thanks, guys. <laughs> Whatever, Ryan, I'm just kidding. You have a master's in the streets. We got this. Yeah, streets. We know this. Congratulations to all the graduates. He the is already a uh, master. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> <A> master. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> okay. Damn. Right. You all can get that. That would have been my joke. <laughs> <laughs> He's a <our> best deuce. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are going to talk about allyship in the Black Lives Matter movement. What? Wow. Yeah. Um, oh. You know, like the, the murder of George Floyd, um, you know, has ignited outrage around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and once again, I guess it, it, it exposed the wounds of um, the deep wounds of racism and inequality, uh, especially here in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. And it's easy to kind of dismiss this unrest as somehow outside our community, something like everybody has, you know, everyone else has to deal with. Um, but we all know that we all know that you know anti-blackness is in our communities. Uh, we also have black people in our communities, um, and so it's something that Filipinos we are a part of. We're part of this society, and we can't we can't ignore it. I completely um, agree. Yeah, we can't ignore it. And so, uh, what we want to do is we're going to interview two people who are you know, community organizers in our community. Uh, Kalayaan Mendoza, who's based out of New York, and uh, Kimi Manikis, who's based out of Long Beach, California. Yeah. Cool. Excited to meet them. Yeah. Excited for this episode. I know you guys probably know Kimi, but... Yeah. 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 But, um, you know, just real quick, before we start this episode, um, you know, what is, I guess, your 
experiences or what have you seen um, in terms of anti-blackness in our uh, in your your families or your communities? Hmm. Mike, start. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, the 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 best way I can frame it up is probably the fact that my at least my dad is an avid Fox News watcher, and he mm. parrots almost everything that comes out of that stupid channel, um, regardless of like whether or not like you know it aligns with you know even his own beliefs, because he's just like, well, they said on the news. Blah, blah 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 and like all the kind of stereotypes about kind of you know what was happening with George Floyd and like the protests slash riots depending on who you talk to about what happened out there um you know he tends to err on the like oh those people are stupid and also COVID is a myth and all those other things that are you know and so like when it comes down to like topics of race I mean it's it's ironic because you know on the one hand you know they will have um very explicitly talked about how they've either been victims of discrimination or witnessed cokers some of them black some of them you know brown um also experienced discrimination in the workplaces and they work for like the government is the best well for it now um you know but at the same time like they'll still kind of espouse like kind of some of these views that like are passed on to them by fox news and like their white colleagues um that are you know they may not be explicitly anti-black but they're very like anti-black and racist um and you know it's it's hard to confront them with those things because they tend to shut down when confronted with an opposing opinion. And so we've kind of learned, and maybe this is—I don't know if this is like a Filipino thing or just my family. We'll just we'll just not talk about things that get us mad at each other, right? Not at all, you know. And so that's kind of where things are at right now. How about you guys? Um, I want to point out a couple of things. Uh, you know. Mike, you brought up like the, you know, Fox News and and just the the political um, aspect of of what's going on right now, and I kind of want to shift a little bit. Of course, there's some things that are very political, and this this is probably um, one of those things that that you can t- put a pin on and say this is a political thing. But I really wanted to call out the morality of of what this movement's about and the morality of just of justice. Um, of equality and and um, I think the reason I, I want to call out the morality is because I have family members who look at who don't want to be involved politically or who don't think that they have uh, a political know-how or don't want to discuss uh, kind of like the hard uh, topics of of what's what's happening um, on our streets or what's happening with Black Lives Matter. Um, and I really want to hearken the the morality part of this discussion. And the other thing I wanted to to call out is most of the time, including for myself, um, my information or my assumptions are uh, show an incompleteness. Um, when I talk to my family members or folks that maybe don't um, align with the way I think, something's not complete, either on their side or on mine, but um, there's usually a, a, a you know a, 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 an annoyance on my part why their information is incomplete, and maybe an annoyance on their part why my information is incomplete. And we're we're trying to we're trying to like uh, um, discuss this very you know hard topic to discuss on incomplete things. And I think um, I think it it begs uh, for for us to. To actually put some some work into trying to have a complete discussion, um, mm. and and I don't know if that's ever gonna uh, ever gonna be. It's it's hard to have a complete discussion, and what you want to do is have a like the most, um, uh, you know, that's why I brought up morality too, is because a, a lot of times people are are okay with not having a complete discussion. They're they're lazy about it, and and um, they'll 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 um, They'll hide behind um, some things that are just easy, and I'm encouraging people to have um, uh, those discussions that are are um, are difficult, and this is one of them. Um, it's a big one, and so yeah. Sorry, that was a long one. Laners. <laughs> 
Uh, it's it's really rough for me. I don't. I think it's because because I'm a darker skinned Filipino. Like there was never a conversation about like race or blackness, really. But it, it was always like there's tinges of anti blackness in the way they co- talked about what I look like. Mm about being darker, about like using skin whitening or insist or telling me to get out of the sun. It's like, it's covert length. It's covert ways of teaching anti-blackness to me. Well, like that was what, what, what ended up happening. And so, um, I don't know if it's just like a form of rebellion, but like the culture that I consumed, right? Like I am a product of the nineties and hip hop culture was very dominant. You know, I, I wore like cross colors or attempted to wear fake color cross colors. Like, you know, all of the things that is from black culture, <laughs> it was who I was. Cause that Crossed was my youth. Colors. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so like, there's a, it feels like even though they were teaching me, don't be dark. I was just like, well, no, I'm going to dress like MC light in the mall, like exact shirt and, and big ass pants, you know, like that was, or like, or I'm going to dress like TLC. Like I'm going to adopt this way of life, even though you're telling me don't do it. Yeah. And so it's, a, it's always a silent rebellion. Cause it's like, I didn't know how I didn't have the language or words to have these conversations with my family. Mm-hmm. What about you, Joe? I mean, I think my, my dad's a lot like your dad, Mike. Um, you know, he watches a lot of Fox News and, um, you know, he's Republican. Um, but I don't know. I, I think now that I'm old, like they they know I have certain political views. You know, they, they already know that uh, I'm going to, you know, I'll call them out also if they like say something really off color. Mm-hmm. Right, um, and I'll I'll call them out on that, and they'll like be defensive, and then, and then they'll quickly change the subject or something. So, but they they, <laughs> it's like an avoidance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they know where my politics are. They know where you know my passion is. Like you know, when when the protests are happening, every protest that happened, I think last week, like every day, uh, my mom called me. He goes, are you at the protest? <laughs> yeah, and and she said like, you know, I know, I know you 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 would join them, but don't because there's COVID. You right. know, <laughs> so, cover your face <laughs> and your head. <laughs> Wear a helmet. Wear a helmet. <laughs> that's a that's another story. I'll tell tell another day. But um, you know, I mean. I know I know they know my politics and I know their politics, so it's kind of like a hmm. I would say some kind of truce, you know. Right. <laughs> but like yeah. a, MU, a mutual understanding. Mutual understanding, yeah. 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 Um yeah. and I will push back if they do say something. Um but I think that's kind of the extent of it. And um I don't know if I can have like a deep conversation with them just because uh I don't know. I just. It's, it, <laughs> Do you think they just rather not? Like, eh, I'd rather not talk to you. Yeah. About this. Yeah. 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 I get yeah, I that mean, sometimes I, too. I feel like it, there's been opportunities more and more lately for a conversation to happen. But I think, and I think I've been trying to mentally and spiritually prepare myself for the, those kind of conversations. Yeah. But I think they can also sense that, that I'm ready to like get at it, you know, if they start going down a certain path and then like. Yeah. That they they probably try to I I mean I can see this dynamic happening now where um, I think my dad will try to kind of provoke into a certain conversation. Mm-hmm. My mom will be like, I don't want to do this right now, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like, but she won't really say it. They'll just kind of like start and start shifting the conversation. And so like mm-hmm. I think like I'm definitely trying to be better about like if it does become a thing that we talk about, like to be able to respond to that in a way that 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 honors the conversation in a respectful way, hopefully. <laughs> Um, but at the same time, it's like, you know, yeah, classic, like avoidance. Like, yeah, if we're not going to talk about it, I guess it's just not going to come up and we're just going to like pretend like it's not a thing. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is the thing and, I know that I need to get over though, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's a work in progress. Um, I'll make r- remarks here and there. Uh, hopefully, uh, um, you know, it makes some kind of 
point, even though it's very, you know, micro. Um, but, you know, I think part of the call uh, that this moment has kind of uh, beckoned is that we need to kind of talk about all the different dynamics of the kind of Black Lives Matter movement um, in our own communities, you know, with our own right. Right. families. Yeah. And, you know, this is kind of a step to talk about it more uh, on a TFAL episode. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now we want to bring on our two guests, Kalyan Mendoza and Kimi Maniquis, uh, to talk more about the, the movement, you know, what we could do as Filipino Americans uh, to support um, you know the black community and uh, our own communities uh, in this moment right now. So um, just uh, sit back, relax, and wait for the commercial to end. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. But, you know. Yeah, <laughs> sit back, relax, and wait for the commercial to end. That's good. <laughs> All right, <laughs> do it. Hey guys hey elaine what's up elaine did you know that we have tea pals <laughs> yes what's a tea pal i mean what <laughs> <laughs> tea pals are our patreons they joined at patreon.com slash tfal podcast and they support us every month oh is that what you announce like uh one of, one of our episodes if there's a tea pal of the episode correct so those people are patreons yes cool really I actually thought they were random. <laughs> <laughs> this is, are you serious? Are you serious? <laughs> Mike is actually serious. Wow, I'm really? learning something today. Yeah. And also all of you right now. <laughs> so if you want to be a T-Pal and surprise Mike, <laughs> join us at patreon.com slash t podcast. But uh, not only do you get to shout out on the episode, you get cool things as a T-Pal, correct? Ooh, Ooh like what yeah. kind of cool things, Ryan? Like what? Like Sometimes a, you get free giveaways. Oh, like what? Like a like a sticker? Yes, yeah, like our logo sticker. What? Or our new T Fell Hearts OPM sticker that is inspired by Chicken Joy Division. And you also get some uh, free books if we get them from the authors. Correct. We'll definitely set aside some for our Patreons. Correct. And pictures of me. I I'm could just actually. No, I will. Just what now exclusive they're... Polaroids? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not that kind of Patreon, guys. Numbered. <laughs> That's totally going to be a thing now. I'm going to take pictures of Ryan and give them to the Patreons. But not only do you get all that, you also get um, uh, some shout outs or say in some episodes. That's we'll, true. We'll get your opinions on certain subjects uh, in upcoming episodes. And we'll also, as a new thing, We'll send you some blooper reels of t mm-hmm. Only for the Patreons. Mm-hmm. Only for the Patreons? Only for oh, the Patreons. Oh, man. If you want some laughs, <laughs> be a Patreon today. Ludes, but no nudes. <laughs> but if subscribing monthly to uh, t Fowl is not your thing, maybe you can support us by giving us a Kofi. Kofi? What's that? It's a one-time donation to this Filipino-American life. Cool. Yes. So either do Patreon or Kofi. What's the website for Kofi, Elaine? Kofi.com slash TFAL. Kofi, K-O-F-I.com slash TFAL podcast. Yes. So thank you very much. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. We are back. We are back to talk to our guests. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have two of them today, if you haven't noticed. Uh, if you're for those who are on video, <laughs> <laughs> or for those who didn't read the description <laughs> where it says who we're talking to right now, <laughs> but we have uh, two guests. Uh, they are, I don't know, how, how do you say, community leaders uh, for us Filipino Americans. Uh, really happy to have uh, you all, you both, on the show uh, for the very first time. And I think w- w- for both of you, we've, tr- we've been trying to get you on the show one way or the other for a while. Um, so our first guest is uh, Kalayaan Mendoza. He's an organizer and movement facilitator. He's based out of New York. And uh, Kimi Manikis, uh, she is the community leader and advocate um, uh, based out of Long Beach, California. 
So welcome to the show. Yay! Woo! Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so Hello. much for having us on. It's an honor. Yes. How are you two holding up during these times? I'll be real. I'm exhausted um, with both holding space for folks, but also organizing numerous protest safety trainings, trying to be out um, out in the streets. Um, but I'm trying my best to do self care and to figure out how to show up, continue to show up for our people. How about you, Kimmy? Yeah, I, I feel I feel you, Kalayan, on that. It's um, it's been. I, I don't think I've. I felt like um, as exhausted as a lot of my colleagues and friends right in this point right now, but um, definitely feeling like there's um, an obligation to to show up, hold space, especially. I think for me, that's kind of like the lane that I'm in is holding space in um, mostly uh, people of color, non-Black people of color spaces or folks who are just entering into the conversation. So um, it feels healing to do that, but it also, I think after several days of it, feel it, it is heavy. But I'm okay, I, I got away to the desert with my family this past weekend for my birthday, and that was really rejuvenating um, and healing. So I feel, I feel okay this week. Happy birthday. Oh, yeah. Happy birthday. birthday. Thank you. You thank are 29 you. again. <laughs> 29. <laughs> no. 29. <laughs> so, of course, we're talking yeah. we're talking today about um, you know, Black Lives Matter and uh allyship um for our African American brothers and sisters. Um you know, as Filipino and uh, Filipino Americans. Um, and, you know, we wanted to talk to you since uh, you both, since you, you both have been working, um, you know, in the social justice movement for so long. Um, so I always st- start with the basics. You know, how did you first get politicized? And then how did you get into kind of this work? Uh, Kalayan, you start. Uh, sure. Um... Growing up, uh, my family left the Philippines during the Marcos regime. And growing up, I remember watching the People Power Revolution as a little kid uh, on TV and feeling inspired, even not really understanding what that means. Uh, Since then, I did a lot of uh, Filipino community organizing in uh, Eastside San Jose, Uh, joined the Tibetan Freedom Movement in the late 90s, and since then, have been engaged in doing solidarity work, um, holistic safety and security, basically protecting frontline human rights defenders from safe violence, uh, everywhere from Myanmar to um, uh, to India, Tibet, uh, China, Taiwan, all over Turtle Island, aka the United States, and was in Ferguson, Standing Rock, um, and most recently Ihumata, which was the Maori land occupation. Um, in Auckland, New Zealand. So I feel like I'm called to this work because our ancestors have always resisted. We have resistance in our blood. And seeing this moment, um, I feel called to really rise in solidarity with um, Black folks, especially the Black folks within our own community. Uh, my, um, yeah, that's my background. And like, we all start somewhere. And right now we're seeing a lot of um, new faces in the movement, and it's so beautiful. And I want to welcome and hug folks from a social distance, and um, <laughs> really have um, have them feel like they have a place in the movement. And so, when when you say like, what, what did you say, like the safety and um, security, so, with, safety and uh, security. Yeah. So, what does that exact, exactly entail? Sure, it looks different for different communities. For instance, with the Maori community. A lot of the work that we did is like what happens if the police attack while people are um, in their encampment? Uh, How do you come up with a plan? Um, Right now, I've been doing, just this week, I did about three different trainings with uh, Asian Pacific Islander organizations doing on the ground um, street medic safety support work. And we go over everything from situational awareness to how to deal with being tear gas, pepper sprayed, um, how to de-escalate. And uh, really how to show up 
and keep yourself and your community safe before, during, and after the action. So did you have to get like kind of medically trained for certain things for like, uh, like the tear gas stuff and like, you know, if someone gets hurt during the, um, you know, during protests? Yeah, unfortunately, there isn't a certification program for um, yeah. state violence yet. Yeah. But hopefully, <laughs> there will be where we can uh, learn how to do that. But in '99, um, right before the WTO protests, I was trained by the Ruckus Society and the Black Cross Collective in the Bay Area mm-hmm. on how to deal with um, uh, tear gas, and pepper spray, rubber bullets. Oh. Um, and since then, have been in multiple scenarios where um, I have been tear gas, pepper sprayed. In Beijing in 2008, I was um, beaten, um, uh, beaten, had my foot broken, um, mm-hmm. and interrogated uh, by the Chinese military. Um, so a lot of it is both the um, theoretical kind of um, training, but also the practical uh, knowledge and application on the ground. Wow, that sounds amazing! Like when I was a kid in high school, in junior high, you to to be able to babysit, you had to go to the American Red Cross. And like, as anybody who's worked in like a youth, uh, youth organization, you're supposed to be like Red Cross certified and be able to do things like, um, CPR or the Heimlich maneuver. Like they train you to do all these things. And I would just like to imagine a world where like, well, I don't know necessarily if you, I want to imagine a world where like there's an organization that's like, Oh, I'm going to train youth on how to do this. Um, but that would be awesome if there was a program that like folks now could do. Most definitely. That's what we do try to um, train folks around is how to keep themselves and the community safe with a holistic safety and security framework, focusing on physical, emotional, spiritual, uh, social, psychological, and digital safety. Great. Uh, how about you, Kimmy? How did you first get politicized yeah. and how did you, you know, how'd you start with the work that you're doing right now? Mm-hmm. So I, too, am a daughter of immigrants. My parents came here uh, post-65, as many of our parents did. Um, they met in L.A. in Koreatown, and that's when they started their lives together. Um, our family moved from there and then moved east, like a lot of families also did. So went to Baldwin Park and then also to West Covina, where they live now. Um, And I think similar to a lot of maybe working middle class uh, folks um, who find like awakening in ethnic studies, that's really where I I think I found um, that spark. And I think personally, I think there's also, you know, being an empath and other qualities like that kind of like lend itself to be becoming um, politicized. But I think ethnic studies for me, um, really was what kind of lit the fire. And at UC Irvine, where we went, where I met um, Elaine and Mike, and then after that, I went to SF State, where I met Joe, um, continued ethnic studies, and then from there, um, I think my involvement with PEP, with the American Educational Partnerships at SF State, um, where SF State students go into the classroom to do ethnic studies, specifically Filipino-American studies classes in um, high schools and now middle schools and elementary. I think that was also another, like an opening to, to working with young people, especially. And um, again, another spark in, in, in leading me to like the field of development, um, social justice and education. And from there, I think, you know, education is great. I, I didn't necessarily find belonging in the classroom. I don't think that that's maybe where my strengths were. So I stayed within the nonprofit realm. Um, and when I had my son, Isagani, we ended up moving back here to Southern California where I landed in Long Beach <clears throat> and have just kind of have stayed here since. So my heart is um, still with young people, serving young people. Um, in my previous organization, we did social justice education and then also the sort of justice work in schools, in communities, and then also in the juvenile justice system. Um, and now I'm doing uh, health equity education in high schools um, throughout LA and Southern California. Nice. So, you know, we were talking about Black Lives Matter and, you know, our community, you know, we have a whole kind of, we encompass a, a whole political spectrum in our 
you know, Filipino American community. So um, I want to ask, in your eyes, why do you Filipinos and Filipino Americans need to care about the Black Lives Matter movement? Let's start with you, Kimmy. The nice, easy question. <laughs> the easy question to answer. My goodness, jump right in. Um, really simply, it's, it's what Black people deserve. It's for the support of Filipinos and non-Black people. Um, it's in this moment in particular where Black people are finding themselves again begging the institutions, begging other people for just basic dignity and the humanity that they, they deserve, it's like the very least thing that we can offer as Filipinos and Filipino Americans, right? <clears throat> is to support them. Um, and being people of color, I think our community has benefited tremendously from the actual labor, the work, um, the movements that Black people have led historically. And we've experienced not the same, I wouldn't say the same, but similar um, histories around systematic discrimination, exclusion. Um, and the only way that we have the privileges and rights that we have today are because of movements that have been largely led by Black people. Um, and that answer is also kind of like, again, it pulls us, it's like, you know, how does it benefit us? And what, you know, and without putting us at the center of it, I do think that, that it really just is the right, um, the right thing to do in this moment. And I think we're being called really loudly um, to respond. Um, Filipinos also, you know, I, I think even our generation, we are, we're consumers of black culture. I, I think we have an affinity to black culture. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the art that we also develop as, you know, our spiritual kind of expression and our cultural expression have been borrowed and influenced largely by Black people um, and without a whole lot of reciprocation um, there. So I think that we, it's time for us to also look at the ways that we um, can kind of conveniently align with Blackness and yet not really take, um, take risks to stand up for what it is that they're asking of other people. Um, so that's basically it, but also it, there's an urgency right now. People are dying. Um, wow. and it's clear that people are dying, whether it's from the pandemic itself and the way that it's disproportionately impacting black people, um, to just regular violence and then state sanctioned violence. I think that there's a, there's a crisis that's happening that we all have a responsibility for, um, responding to. Thank you for that. That's a great question. And I kind of like I'm thinking about it in certain ways in terms of like strategic communications, right? If we're gonna be speaking with our um, friends and family who may, be, um, who may not necessarily understand, um, I think coming from a place of, uh, you know, just letting folks know there are black folks in our community. We need to um, rise up and um, protect them. Um, they're they're human beings that you know are in um are in our neighborhoods or folks who we care about um so in the, just like a very human way that's kind of like one um degree of that another way is just straight up you know meron tayong utang ng loob sa black community that's the only tagalog i know but it works well when working <laughs> with elders but if you're talking about um trans uh, uh transactional solidarity is the 1965 immigration Na um, nationalization act would not have passed for many countries, the Philippines, China, uh, and many countries, if not for black organizers. So even then, and if, even if we put back to the um, Philippine American War with Captain David Fagan um, defecting and joining the Filipino, Filipino revolutionaries, um, the first black uh, uh, military uh, person to do that um, in the Philippines, then that's one direction. But one thing I try to always tell folks is, do you want to be on the wrong side of history right now? Mm. When our descendants look back on this time, do you want them to have shame when they speak your name? Do you want mm. them to look back and forget you? We need to be the ancestors that our descendants look to 
for guidance and are proud of. And um, I hope that speaks to our um, innate sense of hiat and like needing to, um, to really be the people that we are. Filipinos are, um, and I'm, I'm painting broad strokes, but we are inherently a caring, loving people. Why not extend that love right here and right now when a community who is asking for it um, needs it? Mm -hmm. So real quick, you mentioned transactional solidarity. So I've, I've seen, you know, on social media, I've seen some like pushback on that framing of that, of mm -hmm. framing of, um, you know, we owe black people this. Um, I mean, how do you feel about that kind of, I guess, framing? I, um, Kimmy, please um, feel free to um, jump in. You also had some great points um, regarding this. Um, for me, I, as an organizer, am trying to bring as many people into a popular movement. You know, we need the numbers, we mm -hmm. need the resources, and it isn't a time to practice over wokeness and make, um, become gatekeepers. If someone's coming in and um, they're like, well, the black community did this for us and that's great. I, I see your analysis and I'm gonna work with you together as our community to continue to build your analysis. We don't wanna shut folks out. We don't sh wanna shut folks down, mm -hmm. especially when we're building this much momentum because mm -hmm. then it becomes about my, I'm centering myself and like mm -hmm. where I am in my politi um, political process rather than the movement for black lives. That's what I need to always lead with is how can I serve black liberation right here and right now. I, for, I mean, if, I don't know if we're gonna put the video out, but my head is gonna hurt from nodding up and down. Yes and no, yes, yes, yes <laughs> to what you're saying. Um, the whole like overwokeness and the gatekeeping because like we had we had someone reach out to us and they mentioned that they used your they used your beautiful signage, the Philippine X for Black Lives, and somebody called them out and said, "Why do you have that sign? It oh. should only be about Black Lives Matter. Why did you put Philippine X for Black Lives?" And my response to that was like you're already at a Black Lives Matter action. It's obvious you care about Black lives. You are showing solidarity by acknowledging your, your ethnicity, your people being in support of Black people. Like to, ha to create a false gatekeeping entity is ridiculous in a movement right now. Yeah, I agree. And there have been a lot of folks that have brought that up and have a lot of uh, critique around it. And I tell them when I was in Ferguson, October, 2014, Patrice Cullors, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, called all of us non-Black folks of color who are organizers to go back to our communities and find ways to engage. And this is a way to engage. There have been like Lolas and nurses and um, I mean, youth who have really taken this upon themselves and the um, the infighting that I see, the over critiquing that I see, there is a time for that, Fubu. There is a time, but this is not it. Mm -hmm. We need to think about how do we serve Black lives in this moment? Is this about me feeling more woke or is this me about serving um, both the Black community and also our community? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask about more of the, the folks uh, maybe who stand on the sidelines or... Um, are in the you know Joe mentioned this the spectrum of of Filipinos out there or Filipino Americans who may want to be allies but maybe not want to center around activism. Um, do either of you have any kind of um, you know uh, ideas on how do we how do we do that? How do we show our allyship without necessarily being you know out being being in the activist movement? Um, are there are there ways to be that way or is it kind of like all or nothing, or um, what do you guys recommend to, to those who are a little bit more moderate in, in thought but want to be allies? That's a great question, Ryan. I mean, in my mind, it's never all or nothing. We have to have some ways that everyone can be um, engaged in change and also feel like their skills are being valued and what they're contributing is valuable. And when you think about the amount of work that we actually have in front of us, it's a ton of work. So there's not, 
there's not, um, you know, it, it's not going to be like, oh, we're oversaturated. Thanks for right. trying to get involved. There's, there's so many different ways that I think we need to create change. And if we're just looking specifically at, you know, change for the black community that that goes out into other areas it, it connects to violence it goes into like police abolition work it goes into like the fight for ethnic studies um it goes into um you know defending violence against trans folks like there there's so many levels the mortality rates of of women in hospital mm-hmm. rooms so like when you think about the professions that for, that filipinos and filipino americans are in there is always Space for there to be a really intentional way to care for Black people in in our roles, and I think that's the those are the critical questions that we have to I think um, ask ourselves at this point. Or like, how am I going to learn more? How am I going to engage in dialogue that's going to allow me to learn more? And how do I relate it to my career that I'm dedicating my life to? Um, because all of that. You know, not everybody can be organizers. I'm I'm not historically an organizer. I've been part of coalitions that I think um, I will, of course, back organizers' work. Um, but for the most part, I've been like a practitioner that points toward alternatives to like punitive practices, which is again another another need, right? So, so I, I think that there should be openness to exploring. Um, but I think if we also just to push folks who might be shying away from like the visibility of it. Um, you know, I would I would ask them like, what's the um, what's behind that? What's what's with the shying away? Um, and then what's the work that needs to be done there to kind of unpack whatever shame is there? So, yeah. What I would invite folks to do is to look at how disability justice activists have led on everything from uh, mobilizing communities around safety during the California wildfires. So the beginning of COVID, they have shown us that everyone has a place in the movement, regardless of uh, whatever their um, they feel like they can do. In terms of uh, if folks who want to be out in the streets, that's totally fine. Um, there's a space for us to be able to educate one another, to speak to um, you know just to start these conversations, to offer space and to hold space for uh, our black siblings and. Um, uh, black the black community. There's so much that you can do from behind the computer, and I think the fear is that um, activists are kind of like um, in popular media are uh, painted in a certain particular way. Mm-hmm. But activism means caring about your community and doing something about it. Like South Central Farm is a perfect example of this, where there was food scarcity in the area, and what they started to do was to build uh, sustainable um, food ways for people to be able to feed themselves. Mm-hmm. So there is a place for everyone in the movement if folks are scared to do some research. And what I find is a lot of people who decry or who denounce protests might have never been to one. So I invite folks to come to a vigil, come to a locally um, Black-led uh, or um, action or a training or something where you can actually experience and be in that space because movement is powerful. Mm-hmm. And it's inviting, and it's something that everyone has a place in. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, And thank you for saying that you don't have to necessarily just be out. Like, I think the the idea or like the 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 frame of like what uh, activist is, it tends to be like, oh, you're marching in the streets. Like you, they only see what has been highlighted in media. Mm. Um, for myself and um, Mike is muted, but like for myself and Mike, like our families, it's kind of like known like, oh, they're just going to be there. Like they're just going to be in the marches. Like they're not going to ask. And this is the one time where I, I didn't want to go to the marches. I was actually a little fearful because of COVID. Like I didn't mm. want to be in um in these spaces because I was like, if I'm in a, like if I'm in a big crowd and then I have to then go in turn, take care of my fam, my parents, my elderly parents by delivering them groceries, 
how is that irresponsible of me to like go in the streets and do that? Um, and so I, I my question, like, though I'm getting to it is how, what have you been seeing in the streets? Um, what have you been seeing in the protests if you have gone to them? Like, have folks been social distance? Are people wearing masks? Um, what does that look like? I, I can start. Um, unless, give me. Um, what I have seen in New York is um, folks have been social distancing as much as they can, but the reality mm -hmm. is people are still together. But also, um, pretty much everyone has been wearing masks, and we've I've seen white allies, non-black um, folks with um, uh, uh, with uh, alcohol spray, spraying everyone's hands, mm. passing out masks, you know, passing out water and food, doing what the government could not do mm. for us. So um, there is a lot that we we know that in order for us to be able to do the work in the long term, we need to care for ourselves and each other more fiercely. We need to love each other more intensely than this, the settler colonial state hates us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mean you want to add to that? Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Um, so I too haven't been, um, because of also health concerns, haven't been quite out there in the, in the rallies here in Long Beach, um, but I've been communicating with um, my friends who are, are out there as well. A lot of cross issue solidarity that we're seeing. Um, a lot of folks who have not been politicized ever, like just neighbors and like residents who are showing up with like deep, deep like heart for what's happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and just move to tears about what's happening and having these really, um, really like key moments of like realization that this is not the country that this not community that they want to be. These aren't the values that they want um, to exist in their in their um, in their communities. So um, that's beautiful to see, of course. Um, and then I will say that we are we are also seeing. Uh, folks intentionally agitate. So, that, and that's something to really point out as well is that um, folks who who know the patterns of rebellions and uprisings and are ready also to swoop in and and agitate. And that's that's also worth pointing out because we're actually seeing that. Seeing mm -hmm. folks do that. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so a week like of unrest had, had had has occurred, and I will say like things have died down. The curfews have died down, and we 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 cal we calculated the risk, and like we went to uh, the Breonna Taylor um, action in Pan Pacific Park uh, this past Saturday, and it was peaceful. It was beautiful, um, and. I was listening to the crowd and like I heard, I heard white people like young white people saying, Oh, it was, it was really it was, like, this is where we're getting, we are standing closer than we were from last week, which to me tells me they're coming back. Like folks are coming back and I'm seeing like, like, like how you like you how you said like they're giving passing out water, passing out masks, like passing out snacks. Like people are doing that. And like, it brought me to tears because like those are the things that you would see in like May Day marches, right? But like at May Day marches, it's all people of color. Like it's all immigrant people of color caring for each other. There would be like the one pocket of white people, one like white ally, you know, you would see them sparsely throughout the crowd. But this crowd was it felt like mostly white. And I was like, this is what needs to happen. This is what we need to see. Um, and I was like, my heart was so warm because I was like, first off, I hadn't left my house in like, who God knows how long. <laughs> so I was like, I'm so thankful to be in community with people. Like it, mm -hmm. it felt, it felt like if, it felt like this is why we gather. Like this is why we do movement. This is why, this is why we we have conversations and and we we take action. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, 
Ryan, popcorn to you. Next question. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I'm I'm glad that you guys were able to go, um, Elaine. I saw a couple of the photos, um, but kudos to you guys for for being able to do that and uh, and show other Filipino Americans. You know, this is this is what we do. Is in in these times, you know, Filipino Americans, we're gonna we're gonna stand up. So um, I appreciate oh, you guys for doing that. Sorry, ahead, just real Joe. quick. Um, I know they're organizing. Uh, folks are organizing a car protest mm. oh cool so people can stay in their car that's cool uh, sometime this weekend so I, uh, okay. me and girly are planning to go that's yeah cool. I, I love the idea uh-huh. of it's very southern california for us yeah. to, to, to create a car <laughs> protest um yeah. and i appreciate it because it's like a way of social distance and showing our our allyship with the community right it's like what, cruising as a new yorker but, yeah. what is a car <laughs> <laughs> it's this thing with wheels. Wheels, I don't understand. Yes. And then you, and then you have to pay this thing called insurance that you can drive with car. I'm kind of looking forward to like, um, you know, all those convertibles in those Filipino um, parades. <laughs> the parades. <laughs> oh god, no, that's probably not, that's probably not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. <laughs> oh man. Um, Okay, I'm going to ask you guys an interesting question. I, I think it um, uh, might call for a lot of discussion. So um, uh, many people, including Filipino-Americans, uh, focus so much of their attention um, to looting that's occurred during the protests. What do you say to those folks who condemn what's going on because of what they see on TV or what, what, when it comes to the looting? And that's what they, they see. What, what do you say to, to those folks? Uh, either one of you guys, or both. Go ahead, Kimmy. <laughs> <laughs> We're being so polite. Um, I would say watch that Kimberly Jones video. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you have have yeah. seen that, but um, so she's an author, activist, um, and there's a video of her circulating that's just explaining her own personal, I think it ends up becoming just <clears throat> anger, which I think is valid and, mm-hmm. and rage against what's, what's happening. Um, and it also represents the rage and anger that I think a lot of right. black folks and people who live um, in poverty are experiencing right now. And so, I, I mean, it's such a deep, deep discussion that it's like, how do you start talking about capitalism and the ways that marginalized right. people will will enact, you know, like um, violence upon a system that doesn't care about them or that actually value the things in the store more than they value their own lives, right? right. So like that, that it's such a, um, and I think especially when it was even hard to just witness walking around our neighborhood after everything had happened and seeing like every other small business being affected, like having the window smashed in and that it it's like, it really is like, why does, why, whose responsibility is this? And I think it's easy to place it upon individuals, but again, it speaks to a larger um, system that is just disenfranchising folks and not giving them um, adequate ways to not even express themselves, but not, um, you know, like the idea that there's an appropriate way to, to protest and then there's uh, an inappropriate way to protest. We've, we've seen uprisings and rebellions time and time again. And it, it's, it's not just isolated, like people's behavior or choices that they make. It is a result of like power difference and the ability, inability to um, feel human in a moment that, that ran within a system that's dehumanizing you. Um, but I feel like the words of people like, um, Kimberly Jones really speak powerfully to that because she has such um, personal um, heart attached to to the explanation. Um, and then Hassan Minaj, the Patriot Act, also released something that I think folks should really watch. And I could probably take up this whole, uh, <laughs> the content of this podcast too. Um, and so we cannot stay silent about George Floyd. Um, such powerful stuff in there too about why um, looting and uprising happens um, and worth, worth watching. The two messages I have whenever I hear, 
ay sayang namang target kuwawa yung tao yeah. is you know it's like okay first of all calm down um uh, <laughs> um but it's um i go to asking um what did you say were you as mad when the during the pumpkin festival in new hampshire all the pote people the white people had rioted looted and destroyed and inflicted hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage to their community and usually they're like no i didn't even know about that i was like mm-hmm. okay and i always try to come from a place of curiosity and just ask mm-hmm. questions very much in the tradition of um tibetan buddhist um uh philosophy is like asking questions in order to lead people into a deeper understanding of the issue mm-hmm. because if we talk at folks we're talking over them right mm. so there is that there is the um you know what is the difference between um what you're what you saw during the uprising right now for George Floyd and with these um you know hockey fans and um soccer fans uh going um uh, being chaotic what is the difference there the second thing is really around um uh working um trying to understand uh what is their kind of like what is their fear right um why um yes the um the looting is horrible but also the fact that the government had not had essentially put the entire country in massive unemployment for three months but mm-hmm. gave billions and I, i can't remember the exact number but billions of dollars to corporations trillions yeah, trillions mm-hmm. right and i was like what do you expect when people are starving Mm-hmm. And now there's this point what would you do if your family was starving mm-hmm. and try to bring it to that point like it's to humanize what's happening um I am not I will not um decry any um tactic because it has brought people to the table right mm-hmm. it has made the media I mean it made um uh our elected representative our white elected representatives where kin uh Uh, oh god like yeah that was mm, mm. <laughs> yeah that's that's another mm. um, thing but mm. but we um i think there's a it's important for folks to come from a place of curiosity but also to push gently mm-hmm. with respect mm. yeah i was actually having a conversation about this with a friend and then like i wasn't necessarily condoning the uh, looting but I also kind of mentioned, well, you know, like, first of all, like, nobody would be really paying attention mm. if this was like a peaceful protest, right? Mm. Um, and then secondly, like, I was saying, you know, it's just a bunch of corporations. Yeah. <laughs> a lot yeah. of it's corporate stories. Yeah. And then when they said, well, you know, they're small businesses, I would say also, like, um, well, you know, gentrification has done more to ruin small businesses mm-hmm. and corporations have done more to ruin small businesses than any of the looting has been happening. Yeah. But no one's really saying anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think also those those conversations to focus on the looting is, I'm not going to say like, it's a lazy argument, mm-hmm. but but it's a... It's a, a judge, lazy it's argument. A, it's, lazy. it's a lazy argument. <laughs> it really is because because what it what it does is it 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 allows you to say something about something that you don't like. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And it allows you to point to something that we all don't like, right? Yeah. So so it, yeah, it's a lazy argument. It's a lazy argument that that kind of like shields you from having to do some kind of research. Um, yeah. But um, so, yeah. Real quick, uh, Kalian. Um, You mentioned something in your your answer that I want. I know this is kind of a tangent, but if you can give like a succinct answer, how did you become Buddhist? Um, Sorry to put you on the spot, but oh, no, no. Um, <laughs> seriously, Joe. <laughs> I became Buddhist when I was eleven um, and refused confirmation, and um, because I saw the um, there was like a lot of things happening in our church. I'm not going to go into that, but. Um, the uh, the homophobia that I experienced was very much um, almost approved by everyone in the community, oh and um, Buddhism gave me a um, a space to be able to focus on what suffering is and really looking awesome. into um, dedicating myself to alleviating the suffering of all beings, mm-hmm. and it's really something that has guided me and that continues to um, 
Uh, I'm not a good Buddhist, by the way. I'm, I'll, I, will, I will throw down something. That, you know, happens, but, uh, but that's the thing. It's like we're all working on ourselves. And everyone has, the Dalai Lama says, we don't recruit, you know. Um, but it's really about um, being able to find um, peace and to um, be in right relationship with everyone um, and uh, to dedicate ourselves to the liberation of all beings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. There's a cool video of featuring you, your conversation with a priest, right? Um, on next day better. So look mm-hmm. for that. Um, it's a really cool video. I want to look so, for that. It's so beautiful. Yeah. I got to. So I got to see that. And I we'll got to see that. We, we should probably have a uh, off the link. Yeah, we'll, we'll put the link. We'll link the, it uh, in the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Going off on that tangent, question, the yeah. good tangent, Joe. Yeah, that is a good tangent. <laughs> I like meeting Filipino Buddhists because, like, in my own like study, I like I always go through phases where I like garble up all these Buddhist texts, like, or like different like books about it, and I'm like, ooh, one day I will do this, and then I'm like, yeah. no, I'm too lazy to attempt to do these things. So, <laughs> one, one quick just... note. One quick note, Kalyan. <laughs> I used to teach confirmation, and one of my classes was Jesus was a Buddhist. So, <laughs> so uh, that was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, things have obviously changed since I was a kid. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's awesome. It's actually why I vowed to to go back and volunteer to teach because I hated my confirmation oh. classes. I hated oh, them. And I said, you know what? If I'm if I'm gonna do something, I might as well change how they teach it. So. Oh, I just Beautiful. left the church. I mean, don't don't tell my mom and dad. I it's mean, all good. you know, whatever. <laughs> all right. Sorry. <laughs> Long tangent. They, if Go they ahead, don't please. know, they know now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, speaking of mom and dad and families, um, so <laughs> given all the uprisings and the actions, um, I do a family call like with my cousins every Friday. We check in. Um, it started when COVID happened, and um, I use my institutional account to host longer than 45-minute calls. <laughs> it's very beneficial. And... Um, when we started the call, me and my cousin, um, we were a little worried. There's like two of us in the room and we were like, oh, is this going to get weird? Because like the protests have been happening. We live in areas like I live right in the middle. Like if people protest in Hollywood and downtown, they're going to come. And like it was really close by. Um, is this going to get crazy when we like have these conversations? And then um, my cousin Sean was like, well, maybe it'll be good. Cause we'll like, we'll have real conversations about race. And I was like, eh. and it's funny. Like I used to do, I was a diversity facilitator as an undergrad. I used to have to do diversity conversations for college students. And I, I have that skill set somewhere locked into my brain, but the whole idea of having that conversation with my family scares me shitless. Like no joke. I'm, I'm scared. Um, but then we had a conversation and like, it was really interesting how open and like I was I was so happy to hear my family not be like like total right wing left like this is bad you know the looters are bad blah 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 like that's the the typical like far right and we had an actual meaningful conversation um we were saying how like my cousin in Arkansas was saying how like he's the only Asian guy in the south he does shooting competitions and he's always the only Asian guy there. Uh, he goes over to people's houses and they have the Confederate ha- flag hanging out in the house. And like, but they, and they tell him, but you're a good one. And he kind of mm. just, just, he just is like, Hey, okay. Um, and then his wife was like, yeah, they have sundown laws here. But when the sun goes down, if you're black, that you shouldn't be out at night because, because, and it's, it's 2020 and that's a reality for people in Arkansas. And so with him, he started the conversation and I was like, whoa, we're going there. So I'm lucky in that somebody else started the conversation, but if somebody who is listening wants to start this conversation with their family, with their cousins, how do you, how would you suggest they approach or begin to have that conversation with their family? 
all these big questions, big questions today. <laughs> it's easy. This is a fun it's one, so right? Easy. Um, this is a fun <laughs> episode. We haven't talked about food at all. <laughs> oh, I so talk maybe about that should cookies or something. Maybe so that should be part of the answer. You open with the ube cookie. Will you open with the cookie. <laughs> Icebreaker. Here's an ube cookie. Black Ice lives matter. <laughs> there you go. Gotta do it. Um, Yeah, and even as somebody who, like, has done this for a living, like, facilitating and holding space and holding circle, I know how to do guidelines, I know how to create a container, it's still so hard and terrifying, because I think, I mean, I think we we need to also think about ways that, you know, the ways that we set up spaces and, you know, in, in settings that are not our own families, like community spaces, even though they're intimate, how how it doesn't necessarily translate and we probably should again generate new ideas and ways of of doing it that aren't so structured like with the communication guidelines and like you know <laughs> the facilitator role and like you know prompts and all stuff like that um but so that's the technical aspect of it that i'm i think that is exciting to generate as a community um but i think to what I've seen and what I've also experienced and also been guilty of is like the, I think the assumptions that we have of one another in our families that somehow um, this person is immovable and they're fixed in their values and that, um, you know, they're like purely racist and just like have no understanding or capacity to understand um, where, where I'm coming from or where this, what this movement means. And I really, well, while folks are, some folks are very unapologetically racist and anti-Black, I think that can be interrupted in in one particular way and it it needs to just be direct. But I think for the most part, I want to believe that like um, a lot of our family members, elders included, but also peers included, Mm -hmm. and even young people just don't, because how, how much access do do folks have to have these conversations? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think I'm, I'm able to have some conversation because I'm within circles right. connected to work and community, but not everyone has the space to, to really like ask the tough questions to sound stupid, to mess up, to like, to be vulnerable, um, to like push back and then hear another answer. And I think we, we all have to be able to enter it by learning together. And I think that, um, you know, for families that, so example, okay, for, for us, um, we're, we're having to, we're going to have to have some tough conversations as a family. We have, I, my nephew's black. And I think that we have talked about it, but not in a way, and not in this moment in particular, that really allows us to interrogate how anti-blackness comes up mm-hmm. in in our family structure, in our interactions with each other, in our like discipline of a of a small child, like that's that's where like personally really matters, and there's a lot at stake because it's impacting somebody that we love. Um, and I actually, a friend of mine just came out with a a book, Parenting for Liberation. Trina Green Brown, she's a community leader in South LA, amazing parent. Um, she has a podcast too, and it centers around. Um, the black child, but also speaks in particular to black parents and um, kind of transforming that belief that you have to parent from a place of fear and more from a place of liberation. And the whole book is a, is a guide around that. And I think there's some really um, just helpful things for non-black caregivers and parents to, to um, that are lessons within that, that we should also be learning together. So I think I, all that to say, I, I think it's a continuous journey that we we have to embark on together, and it's not approached as though I have something to teach you and you have to then learn. But like Kalea and said, like we come from a place of curiosity. Help me understand, like how why how you got to that um, to that belief. Like what happened to you that, or what was said, or what you know what kind of shaped that belief for you. And then here's what I think, you know. Um, and it is very, very hard to kind of put, we have our whole family dynamics that I think impact communication and just just really uh, dismantle productive dialogue. But 
these are the people we love, you know, like these are the folks that um, I think if you can be vulnerable with somebody, it should be um, with family. I get that not everybody has that structure, but like for a lot of us, that's the place where these safe conversations can happen. I look at this in terms of being a nonviolent direct action organizer. Um, you want to have your strategy ready. Mm -hmm. uh, when you go into a conversation, what is your goal? If your goal is to get someone to completely shift, um, there's something called the spectrum of allies. It's a tool that uh, was created by a friend of mine, um, Ivan Marovich, who was one of the um, organizers behind this over the nonviolent overthrow of Slo Slobodan Milosevic. But basically, you have to assess, will you be able to move this person from either neutral to um, if, uh, uh, a active ally? Um, my dad is a former cop. He's a libertarian former cop. And um, it's um, for me, it's like setting up a boundary. It's like we're just not ever going to agree. But my other relatives, um, I'm like, I can maybe get them to agree that Black Lives Matter in this conversation. And I think about what are my resources? What do I have on, you know, uh, mentally and emotionally? Because as a very tired 41 year old activist, I only have so many um, uh, energetic resources to move people through. So I always think about it in terms of um, strategy. What do I wanna um, accomplish here? And a lot of times your tactics are gonna change. You might be coming from, um, oh, here, watch this, uh, um, you know, listen to this T-Fal episode. Um, or, what? Uh, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. For real. I mean, like y'all are so uh, accessible. Like it's, it's you, you, there's a sense of like safety and yet the analysis that you bring into pretty much every single episode, it, it just astounds me. So it's very what? masterful in how y'all have been able to do that. Yay. But, good job, food appreciator. Good job. Good job, Ryan. Good job, Ryan. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but, yeah, I invite people to think about it in terms of um, strategy. What What is your goal? Uh, what tactics make sense with the audience that you're working with? What resources do you have? And also, what's your timeline? Like, if you got, like, five minutes, you know, is there enough time for that? So really figuring out how you can use that spectrum of allies to move someone from uh, neutral or uh, neutral to a active um, ally. Um, and honestly... I'm just been organizing my cousins. I'm like, so here's mm -hmm. the um, here's the files mm -hmm. to print out the posters. Here's what you need to do uh, when mm -hmm. you're on the ground, and um, work with the folks that um, um, utilize the resources that you have in order to meet the goal that you want. I to give a comment. And there's there's so much information out there. Sorry, Ryan, yeah. but I, I think like Kalayan said, there's so much information out there that it's easy to kind of just like easier now to, to like funnel things that are mm. meaningful their way and it helps to also filter through the like getting all inundated with too much information too so mm -hmm. i was going to make a comment that um i think especially in, in, in this group that we're currently in right now or even just our t file folks when we talk about talking to our parents for uncomfortable um topics i think we we're already frustrated <laughs> We come in with a certain frustration that, um, that you know, call it a privilege uh, that we ha were educated in a particular way, whatever you want to call it. But we come in, we're, we're coming in hot, you know, mm -hmm. we're coming in hot. And I think a lot of times, so Kalayan, I appreciate the, the words that you, you use is like basically have a strategy be for yourself too. Because if you, yeah. you know, one of my friends said, you're, you're trying to change 30 years or, or more in 30 minutes of a mentality in 30 minutes. And it's, it's not, it's not really going to happen that way. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, I have to say that um, personally speaking, I'm, I'm really happy that, that my parents tolerate my loudness <laughs> and tolerate my, um, my relentlessness. And I think that's the other thing I wanted to say is like, this is a, you know, talking about, uncomfortable things that is right to talk about takes relentlessness. It doesn't mean rudeness. It doesn't mean, um, uh, you know, take it to a level of, of um, uh, like anger, um, but towards just being relentless and, 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 
and keep talking about it and keep talking about it. And so I appreciate those answers because it's helped me a lot too when you have a certain strategy. I definitely have a different strategy when I talk to my mom and, and when I talk to my dad. Um, you know, they're very different. Um, and, uh, you know, it took years to, for them to trust me and understand that what I stand for is the same thing that they stand for, that we want to do what's mm. right. Um, and so that's what we want to get to. So I appreciate those answers, by the way. So I just wanted to make that comment. Mm. Stop oh. coming in hot, people. <laughs> 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 to, to tag on to Ryan, like the strategy of different parents, like I completely agree. Because like when, um, when, um, tr- when Trump said that he was going to enact the, what is it? I forgot what it's called. But whatever the, the, the act was that hadn't been used since the Rodney King riots. Um, and essentially like, it was like, was like martial law. Um, I was actually on the phone with my dad when the news spread that, that, uh, that the act was going to be enacted and my heart sunk because my parents left the Philippines after martial law. My dad already experienced this in the seventies. He, he laughs and tells stories about being out past curfew and evading the police, which in the Philippines, he would have been he would have been disappeared. I wouldn't have a dad. I wouldn't exist. And so like, I remember I said to my dad, I'm so sorry that you have to go through this again. And like, it, like I wasn't coming in hot. I was coming in, I was coming in right. sad. Right. <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry. And, and then my dad was just like, you know what? It, it is what it is, but we'll get through this. And also like, I think there's like a resilience there that some folks, like you forget how resilient some folks are because you're so caught in the bubble of like your own self, especially in quarantine, you've been caught in the bubble of just your house of just like thinking like, how do I care for my people? Like the immediate people that you forget, like, no dude, like, these folks came here like they, they they moved to this new place and probably didn't have anybody and they came here and they built a life. We'll endure this. They'll persist. We can have these conversations and move forward. And also I would say uh, don't try to change someone's mind on social media. It's never going to work. That part. That part. Ever. Ever. I can't just put passive aggressively send Facebook messages. It doesn't work. Kimmy, I'm with you. Every time I see one of those math problems, I just want to put Black Lives Matter. (laughs) Like, how many of these blocks do Black Lives Matter? (laughs) (laughs) Or, like, subtweeting doesn't get anywhere. (laughs) Yeah. But Elaine, I think what you raise also is um, there, there's something in there about healing for for those generations that also has not happened, or like that that there's unresolved some trauma there that does mm. that maybe block the ability to to um, kind of build the empathy needed to translate it to what's happening now, you know, and not uh, again that's a denial of something that are you know folks are deserving of um but because i think it, it's easy to be like well we got we're okay right like i made it through i cut mm-hmm. I, I pushed through our families pushed through we're tough we, we made it through why can't folks just go with it um but there's there's definitely a, a healing piece around trauma that carries on into how we then collude with you know anti-blackness and mm-hmm. white supremacy Externally. Mm. One thing I, I invite folks to do is to come from a place of compassion and love and respect when coming into the space, both for the person you're speaking with, but also for yourself, right? Because decolonization, um, dealing, uh, being anti-racist is part of decolonization, right? And in that process, it's a lifelong process. So we need to give ourselves the patience and the gentle kindness for ourselves too, if we're not able to change someone's um, uh, someone's view or like move their um, the um, the needle a certain direction, because this is going to be a long struggle, and um, we need folks to be able to care for themselves because they're going to be caring for others um, as they um, help facilitate or guide them through this process. So, speaking of long struggles, how do we sustain the, 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 
how do we sustain the movement after this moment, this uh, kind of uprising kind of uh, subsides a little bit? Um, you know, the new cycle is going to, you know, the new cycle is going to change and then we're going to talk about different, something else. You know, how do you sustain this kind of a uh, moment right here? Grace Lee Boggs, in a conversation with Angela Davis back in 2013 in Berkeley, said that we need to move away from protest organizing and into visionary organizing. And what that essentially means is we all need to think about what is the world we want to live in? What does a world look like when Black people are not being murdered for sitting in their homes by themselves? What does a world look like for a young Black kid to be able to go to the store to pick up Skittles? I think we need to, we are at a point where Angela Davis and, uh, um, uh, said, we are at a point of possibility to reimagine and recreate what that is. We can't just be fueled by rage. Rage is a powerful um, source of strength, but it doesn't last. We need mm. to be fueled by vision and love and hope and joy and uplifting those things and centering Black hope Black love, Black joy right now mm -hmm. will help us find our compass points in how we move forward for a world that is more just, a world that respects everyone, and a world where we can just be human beings and happy. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I got. That's yeah. beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Kimmy? Kimmy? Don't make me follow that, please. That was really <laughs> said. Um, like, so lovely and perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Like, I mean, like I said, in terms of like doing, there's so much to do. Um, there's, and then there's different ways of being. I think this is also, you know, beyond, of course, campaigns are important. Of course, like we have to become physically engaged. And of course, we have to show up in those moments. Um, there's a lot of budget advocacy things happening right now. There's a lot of policy being pushed. There's a lot of calls for accountability. And we have to show up for those things immediately after all of this. Um, but it, it's also like, how are we... I think the Black Lives Matter movement is calling for just a completely different way of being. And that's what we have to learn from this movement is that... Mm -hmm. It's not just a change of systems. Like if we're looking to, you know, abolition means like a world without prisons and police and these systems that are harmful. So how do we then relate to each other? How, how do, what replaces that? We can have like community processes, transformational justice, things that are like generated and held by the people and not rely, we're not relying on systems to hold those things for us, right? Um, it requires like nonviolence. It, it requires like uh, an elimination of violence by the state. And that's all we've kind of known. So like, how then do we create and how do we live in a world and then be open to, to living that way? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that we, you know, I don't think we know what that looks like because we haven't been exposed to models like that. And there's, that vision is going to be so important in moving us and in guiding us um, toward collective liberation. I know that's huge, but it's just, we can no longer kind of exist in the existing systems. We have to be willing to let them go, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, agreed. I think that's, all of these are just like excellent, excellent points about like the work that we all need to do. And then, like, there are just some simple facts that I feel like some Filipinos don't understand, like that the U.S. police state exists because of slavery, that police were, ex they were founded to police slaves so they wouldn't run away from the plantation. And so much of the Filipinos that I, I've encountered are like, well, you got to respect the law, you got to respect the law, but how can you respect law that is existed to, to monitor property because they view black people as property mm -hmm. and they can tell us now that it's like that's in the past that's in the past that's in the past it is not in the past it's the present it has always been and so when anybody tells me like oh you, if you're saying defunding the police you know what would that mean for safety there is a 
population that has never been safe from the police and mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. black people have never been safe and so in turn the other indigenous people of color also are not safe because we are viewed through the lens of you're not white you could be property that's how it is and i feel like like just that fact alone i don't know if filipinos necessarily know that um that was like a new thing for me um in recent years but it's just like it's just a, it's just a common fact like i already didn't trust the cops because in the philippines they nearly killed my dad but it's kind of like mm-hmm. i don't trust the cops here because they view brown people like property so that's just one little thing that i would like to impart on this episode mm-hmm. if you're going to talk about your families maybe have that knowledge you can look it up it's, mm-hmm. it's real it's history it's our history because we are americans and another part of uh, kind of history is that a lot of policing policy and a lot of policing tactics, especially like law enforcement, um, surveillance by FBI, was actually first formulated in the Philippines by American colonial officials. Mm-hmm. Right? And it's, um, it kind of generated from policing uh, descendants or descendants, not, uh, descenders from um, dissidents, sorry, <laughs> uh, in the Philippines so that they don't overthrow the colonial government. So just FYI, mm-hmm. like it affects, it's historically affected the Philippines as well. Um, there's a good book on it called Policing uh, America's Empire, I believe, in the Philippines by mm. Alfred McCoy. So check that out mm. if you're so inclined. Yeah. Uh, so, so always dropping that knowledge. No. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Bernardo. No. <laughs> But uh, no, thank you. Uh, we reached yes. kind of the end of the episode. Um, thank you for imparting, you know, your 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 knowledge, imparting your love, your passion. Um, you know, just thank you for being you, um, and thank you for yes. sharing that piece of you with us. Yes. Um, thank you so much. Real thank quick, are, any, are there any kind of quick resources for? Sorry, are there any quick resources for folks out there? who want to like know more, learn more, et cetera. Um, I have there been are so uh, many. Go ahead, yeah, go. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Quick. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Legit Google Asian American solidarity, black lives matter. There are so many resources that have been um, curated. Um, I'm just going to make a plug. If you go onto my Instagram um, or Twitter at Kala Mendoza, um, I've been collecting and curating those um, for folks to utilize and to um, to share and to spread. Um, there is no reason for folks not to feel like they, can, they can't self-educate, especially if they're indoors. Um, and I just want to just say thank you so much to everyone on TFAL. Um, y'all have been a source of self-care for me um, and safety um, in these times and beyond. So the work that you're doing um, has huge impact, and I'm just um, I'm I'm so super nervous even being on here. So thank you all. Aww. don't be nervous. I want to echo that gratitude. <laughs> so I echo that gratitude. You all provide me with such joy, and like I feel so seen. I feel very like mm. like the the Hilalpa episodes are like the <laughs> best thing to ever come into existence <laughs> because they just make me laugh so hard. Um, and it, I'm just so proud that y'all are the homies oh. doing this. Oh, and speaking thank, thank of Hilalpa. Having these conversations. Oh, wait, I have a, I have a tag at that. Speaking of Hilalpa, Kimmy and I actually had talked about this. If you want to, if you want to talk about anti-blackness or racism with your family, maybe change the lyrics to your favorite karaoke song <laughs> and then sing it. So like you do you do your own version of My Way and be like, and now the time is near for racism to be over. Like something like that. <laughs> it's, it's Hilau. I don't then, know. <laughs> it's Hilau. And then your score at the end We'll never get to 100 because we'll never arrive, right? It's a journey. <laughs> right on, right on. <laughs> yeah. No, your score so at the smart. end, instead of da, 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 it says 100, it's going to be like da, 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 da. Black Lives Matter. Yeah. That should be the score. There you go. Whatever there the song is. So anybody who's good at programming karaoke machines, you can do that. Feel free. That's our Hilalpa contribution. Our Hilalpa, Hilalpa uh, Black Lives Matter. Kimmy, did you want to plug anything? 
I think there was a really cool um, guide that a bunch of students from, I think, was it Fordham had created? I think you all posted it. That had a lot of really good um, on allyship. Um, that that was an interesting uh, uh, resource that I saw, and it had a ton of resources at the end too. Um, and it was it's great that it was created by students, college students. So I, Actually, I think it was like a Filipino association, right? The Filipino Student Association at uh, Fordham. Is that right? Something I think like that. So, yeah. Okay, just Google that? that and you'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Three um, Filipino, uh, Filipino scholars that I would uh, recommend folks follow is um, at Pinaism. It, uh, that is uh, Professor, mm -hmm. yeah, Professor Allison um, Piatanko Kubales, uh, EJR David. Uh, Professor E.J.R. David in Alaska and Professor uh, Kevin Nadal um, here in New York C City. Thank you. Cool. Thank boys. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Boys. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Take good care of yourselves during this time. Yes. And we oh, will. Yeah. Like, space for joy. Um, do you want to plug your Instagram? You said Kalam Mendoza. Kimmy, do you want people to follow you or no? No, that's okay. <laughs> okay, give me, give me. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. I really want to say thank you to you both. Um, Kala, this is the first time I've ever met you, but your artwork is really inspiring. And I saw it at, diff at marches. I saw the Vietnamese for uh, Black Lives, and it made me cry because I was like, oh, my God, there's another one. I'm not alone. <laughs> um, so it was happy. And Kimmy, you're, like, totally my hero at Irvine because I'm, like, totally fangirling on Kimmy right now because you're a cow modern and you were, like, so cool. And I can't <laughs> believe that you, like, think that we are inspiring because you're so cool. Oh, my God. I wasn't going to bring it up because, you know. <laughs> But you know, Kimmy is the queen of uh, Kaaba Modern. So. <laughs> oh my god. I'm the Lola. Lola of Kaaba Modern. But you're the best. My kid came home with. Oh, thank you, Lee. No, I went to go pick up my kid, and he had on. He switched sweatshirts with his friend, and it was and it was a Kaaba kid sweatshirt. And I was like, Do you even know what that is? And he was like, Oh, my friend is part of like. The crew of Kaba kids, and I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Some learning to do, kid. Some learning to do. Know your history. Know your history. No, no. no history. I mean, he doesn't know that, like, mm. they're often imitated, never do. I don't know. I forgot. It's been so long. I don't remember anyway. the time. <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, thank you to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Right. This Philippine American Life is produced by Michael Nailat. Our intro and outro music is by Roger Habon, aka 10.4 Raj. Resident reality checker Gurley Collado. Legal advisor Rianne Fajardo. And graphic design by Vincent Collier.